we, we're buzzing around these estates that we didn't really know because that's that's how we got our kicks by bike riding around mysterious housing estates. And we all come zooming at full pelt round this corner into what turned out to be a cul-de-sac. Ha! No fun to be had in a cul-de-sac. Let's blow this scene. So the lads all slam their brakes on, do you, he's head back again. I slam my brakes on, and I had mentioned this was a brand new bike. Ooh. Yeah, so the, the brakes work, which is good, it's what you want from brakes, but they worked a little bit too. The bike stopped, I didn't. I went straight over the handlebars like the rocketeer, head first into a lamppost, boom! I knocked myself clean out. Now this is where it gets a bit weird. Um, I came round, always a bonus, in, um, on the sofa in a lounge I didn't recognise uh, with a not unattractive teenage girl leaning over me and I remember it very clearly being the first ever time I was exposed to cleavage and thinking, oh, I like that <laughs> <laughs> and um, she shouts back into her house Mum, he's not dead! <laughs> which is what you want to hear when you've regained consciousness sorry Oh, I've only just noticed. That's me. <laughs> that was me. I, um, I was in a play where I was supposed to be playing um, Jenny's father. And they grayed me up so that I'd look older. I wish I looked like that now. <laughs> I would be so happy if that's what I looked like. I used to, I used to be like, oh, I don't want to be grey. I don't want to be grey. I'd love to be grey. Oh. Oh. oh, bless. Anyway, moving on. Um, so anyway, I wake up and I'm in this strange person's house and it turns out I was, um, they were a family who lived in this cul-de-sac and had witnessed my, my propelled suicide attempt and they'd taken pity on me and they, they brought me in and um, they, you know, they made me comfortable until I came round and then they put some frozen peas on my head, massive bump on my head, put some frozen peas on my bump, um, asked me, you know, where I lived and what my phone number was and they rang my parents because that's what people did in the 80s if they discovered an injured child, they rang your parents. They didn't bother with an ambulance. Why should we ring them? They're busy. We'll just ring your mum and dad. Yeah, unless, unless you were like hemorrhaging from an artery or missing a limb, no one phoned an ambulance. They used to just ring your mum and dad. So, um, and as I said, I was right on the other side of Chanter, so it was gonna take my mum and dad a good 15, 20 minutes to get there with my mum freaking out all the way. You know, I'm a boy, my boy's wounded. My... You know, with that dying breath, that woman swore we weren't Jewish. <laughs> Now, as it turns out, this family that I was now lodging with temporarily were Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, they were opportunist Jehovah's but They weren't going to miss out on this trick of having a literally captive audience. Uh, and my dad still says it's one of the weirdest experiences was to walk into this stranger's life and, and, and find his son sat in a semicircle of chairs with a big mug of tea in one hand and a copy of the Watchtower in the other. It was very strange. He was really curious about it as well, all the way back. He was kind of going, so what, what sort of stuff do they talk about then, David? What's, what's all this Jehovah stuff? I don't know, Dad. I'm 10. All I know is now I really like tea. <laughs> and cleavage. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we just, we were just, yeah, I got, I, I got back and I didn't go to the hospital or anything. They, you know, they just, you know, a bit blurry vision for a bit. My dad checked I was okay every now and again by going, you're right. <laughs> if, I, if I didn't fall over, I was good. But yeah, I guess we were just a tougher breed of kid back then, which I think could be demonstrated by our film classifications. You see, nowadays, there's so many film classifications, I can't keep track of them all. There's a 12s, 12 A's, EIEIOs, there's all sorts. When I was a kid, we had four we had U, PG, 15, 18. That was it, okay? That was it. U meant anybody could watch it. PG meant anybody could watch it, providing your mum and dad went, yeah, you can watch that. 15 meant nobody could watch it unless they were 15 or older. Or your parents went, yeah, you can watch that. And then there was 18, which you were not allowed to watch unless you were 18 or older. Or your parents went out and you went around to your friends and watched it. But it's interesting because the films when I was growing up, I can't help thinking, if they were made nowadays, they'd probably have much higher classification. Take something like Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? Possibly one of the greatest films ever made, right? It's terrifying! It's a PG! If that film was made now, it would be an 18 easy. I went, I, went, I went to watch it with my mum, I was about nine. 
And it was, it was a strange because my, my dad was normally the one who took me to the cinema, but my mum took me on this occasion because she really fancied Harrison Ford. <laughs> I remember very clearly, she dressed, she put lipstick on. <laughs> I was like, mum, it's not the theatre, he's not going to be there. Bless her. But yes, that scene at the end of Raiders, you know the famous scene at the end of the Raiders Lost Ark where the power of God comes out of the Ark and literally melts the faces of Nazis. All right? It's right there, it's full frontal Nazi face made All right? It doesn't cut away, it's not soft focus, those faces melt. Right? It's a PG. That's all. That's made now. Can you imagine, can you imagine children today watching that? Ah, mummy, the Nazis are melted! It's a horrible, horrible thing. But I don't understand that. Right, Jaws. Jaws is a PG. A film about a great white shark that eats people. That's a pet. No, no, no. I'm a great white shark. No, 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 no. Here's the scene where I bite a man's leg off. No, 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 no. I've got the same film rating as The Sound of Music. <laughs> the Sound of Music is a PG. I what? How? What's offensive about that? Well, well, there's Nazis in it, but I don't think any of them melts. <laughs> I haven't watched it for a while, but I'm, I'm pretty, I'll, I'll have to give it a rewatch to make sure. Watership Down, by contrast, oh, oh. is a U. No. Possibly the most traumatising film you can watch as a child. The unresolved childhood trauma that still lingers today, no doubt, caused by parents in a video shop in the 80s going, Oh, we'll get that one for the kids, it's got rabbits in it. An hour later, bright eye, Mummy! The rabbits are dying! Uh, we, are a, we are a tougher breed of child. Tougher. I'm just having a skip on my notes, because I think, have I missed anything? No, I'm good, I'm good. I'm just, I'm getting through this quicker, brilliant. And another thing about the bike riding is that we'd be out all day. And this evening, we'd be up in the morning, we'd go on our bikes, and our parents wouldn't see us till dinner time. And this was before social media, this was before Facebook, WhatsApp, GPS. Our parents would have no idea where we were. Literally, we could be on the moon. Imagine that happening now, it'd be pandemonium. It'd be all over the news, it'd be the little ribbon thing going on at the bottom of CNN. People doing appeals, it would be all over social media, it would be chaos. Uh, and I suppose it's because it's, we live in a, in a much more climate of fear now, I guess, I suppose. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot more to be afraid of, particularly as a parent, you know, because you've got the news and the media pumping out all this negativity about how there's a paedophile hiding behind every bush, waiting to lure our children in with a train of skittles. And it's just, you know, I mean, and I'm not naive, I'm not saying we didn't have paedophiles in the 80s, of course we did, it's just that you generally, you knew who they were back then. Every, every street would have the one bloke you were told to avoid, don't go near Sid at number 12. Just, if he invites you in, don't. He, just, he hasn't really got any kids. It's just, no, don't, don't do that. It's, 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 a different, it's a different world, you know, it's a very, very different world. A lot to be scared of. And the modern world is complicated as well. I don't quite understand how young people function in the modern world. I'm slightly in awe of them because there's so much stuff that completely bamboozles me as a newly middle-ager. I was watching the news the other day. Um, I was scrolling through the news feed on my phone and this, um, this big splash headline popped up. Should gender-neutral toilets be compulsory? <laughs> and I just thought, wow. I have never been so glad to have grown up in the 80s. <laughs> you know, I mean, all we had was the daily threat of nuclear war, but at least we didn't have to worry about whether our toilets were inclusive enough or not. How can a toilet be gender neutral anyway? I do not understand it. How, how does that even happen? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring now, just to be specific. Um, am I going quieter? Yeah. Yes. I think the, oh no, I'm back. Ooh. <laughs> good, good job I've got my secret spare mic. <laughs> Nobody's gonna want that one back. Um, what was I talking about? Gender neutral toilets, that's right. I will throw my hat into the ring. I have no issue with the concept of gender neutrality, all right? If people want to identify as being a man or a woman or a fucking lawnmower, I don't care, all right? But everybody pees one of two ways. You stand up or you sit down, that's how it works. You're not gonna start doing it hanging from the ceiling like bats. So I can't quite see how a toilet can be gender neutral. It's a strange concept. And while we're on the subject of gender, something else that was in the news, that did actually 
offend me a little bit. And that's not easy to do. I'm very difficult to offend because there's not a lot I genuinely care about. But um, another news headline. Apparently there are certain quarters that are lobbying for the banning of Father's Day. Have you heard this? What? Yeah, apparently because, because it's discriminatory towards same-sex couples. Hang on. All right. I'm a father, and I don't want to sound selfish, but I quite look forward to the one day a year where I get a lie-in. I think I've earned it. The other 364 days of the rest of the year when I'm up reading Pepper's Pumpkin Party at 5am. Again, I think it's justified. Uh, you know, for, for Father's Day a couple of years ago, my wife, bless her, she just took the kids out for the day. That was my present, she just took them out for the whole day. It was lovely, I just, I sat around in the house in my pants just watching TV, I wanted to watch, it was bliss. Don't take that away from me! I'm asking nicely. But what annoyed me, and I'd be interested to know what you guys think about this, is how come, if that's the drum that people are thumping, how come no one's calling for the banning of Mother's Day for exactly the same reason? Because surely if that's your argument, that it's distributed towards same-sex couples, then the same applies. Oh, no. No, no. All right to have a pop at us dads. <laughs> no one's messing with the mums. Oh, no, you take them on at your peril. You come between a woman's annual entitlement to breakfast in bed and a bunch of flowers. It doesn't care what gender you identify with. She'll claw your fucking eyes out. <laughs> Uh, complicated world. I've, in many ways, I think my whole life has been preparing me for middle age because I've always been a bit of an old soul. I was the world's strangest teenager. My friends would bring me up and be like, Scotty, what are you doing tonight? We're going to go to the park and drink cider and maybe set fire to a bin. And I'd be like, oh, well, you know, my book's just got good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Inspector Morse is on tonight, so I think I'm probably just going to stay in, but you, um, you guys, you guys have fun. You give that bin what for from me. Yeah. The phone used to be on the wall. Remember that? The good old days. Fuck. I don't have an issue with mobile phones. I don't. I've, mine's in my pocket there. You've probably all got yours here now, on silent, preferably. Um, but I kind of, I miss the days when phones weren't quite so accessible. Phones weren't so all-pervading, because everyone's always got everyone's on their phones the whole time. It's taken away all the magic of actually getting a phone call. I remember when the phone used to ring, and it was an event. Your phone rang, and you'd be like, oh, it's the phone! Who could that be? Now you know, because it's there. There's the, there's the names on the screen. There's a picture of them on your phone. Like, you know who it is. Yeah. And yes, the phone used to be mounted to the wall. The antithesis of mobile. Ours, and usually in the most inconvenient place, ours when I was growing up, it was in the front hall opposite the front door. So probably the area of the house that got the most thoroughfare. There, was just, there were no private phone calls in my house growing up. Phone sex was not an option for Dave when he was growing up. It doesn't really work as a spectator sport. Oh, what are you wearing? A cardigan! Not you, Mum! <laughs> What's that, love? Uh, no, I, I can't really touch myself at the moment. The postman's here and he needs a signature. <laughs> uh, not mobile in the slightest, unless you've got one of those slightly longer flexes that allowed you to walk around with it. We had one of those put on an R1 so that my mum could walk around the house and talk to my nan, inadvertently wiring the entire house up like a cat's cradle. When my mum was on the phone to my gran, trying to do anything around the house, it was like Mission Impossible. I'm just going to go and get some ginger nuts out of the kitchen. <laughs> and I feel sorry for kids to have their mobile phones on them constantly because they're missing out on the excitement of the phone. We've all been there, those of my generation and older. You know, you know, you get up to the front door, you've got two weeks worth of shopping in each hand. You're trying to get your front door key in with your teeth and you hear your phone ringing on the other side of the door. The, the phone's ringing! The phone! Your bags are splitting, your 80s shopping is going everywhere, you've got Panda Pops rolling down the driveway. You finally get in, you get to the phone, and what happens? It rings off. And you would never know who called you. No caller ID, no voicemail. The only way you could find out who called you was to ring round all your family and friends and go, did you just try to call me? 
while you're doing that, your family and friends are all on the other side of their front doors going, the, front, the phone's ringing, the phone's ringing. <laughs> One of those big old ring dial phones as well, do you remember those? It used to take five, five or ten minutes to ring a number because you had to wait for it to come back around. Nine was the last digit. So if you had to ring the emergency services, you needed to plan in advance because you, you could burn to death while you're waiting for the phone to go. Like, hello, emergency services. Uh, yeah, can I have the fire brigade, please? I've just put a pan of chips on. <laughs> have you got a chip pan fire, sir? Well, no, not yet, but it takes 20 minutes to ring you, buggers. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to get ahead of the game. Now, now technology's everywhere. It's all pervading. And I am not one of these more mature people that's now against technology because I'm getting old. I do like technology. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it. I think it has its use. But I don't think... I don't think it's as necessary as it, it seems to have become. It's, it's, it's telling us it's necessary, rather than us actually needing it. Look at something like Google. I'm not the biggest fan of Google, because Google, for me, has taken all the fun out of being stupid. <laughs> there was a time when people were ignorant and they were perfectly happy about it. You know, people, people just went through their days not knowing stuff and it was fine. You know, and you need that. You have to have stupid people in the world. You can't have everybody being clever, because that just upsets the natural, natural equilibrium and then the world will tip off on its axis. You know, 15, 20 years ago, you would just say to me, Dave, what's the melting point of lead? I'd be like, I don't know. Why would I want to know? How, how would my quality of life be in any way improved by knowing the melting point of lead? Shut up, leave me alone. I've got a very busy day not knowing lots of other stuff. Can you leave me alone? Now, it's like, Dave, what's the melting point of lead? Hang on, I'll Google it. 327.5, just in case anybody's interested. Degrees. Uh, yeah, just technology is it's insidious. So the way it sort of creeps in and suddenly becomes, becomes, you know, you can't survive without it. Like probably, if you're being honest, you don't really need it. I'll give you a prime example. Um, we moved house not that long ago. And in doing so, we found ourselves on the market for a new fridge freezer. So we go down to the nearest purveyor of electrical appliances. We go in, we find the, we find the fridge freezer section. Um, we hand the guy a bit of paper that's got the measurements on it for where we want the fridge freezer to go. And we say, find us a fridge that will fit that. Off you go. And he takes us, of course, to the most expensive ones. For us. Big American-style fridge freezers. You, know. you can tell it's an American-style fridge freezer because it's got a gun rack. <laughs> and he starts going on about it. Goes, oh, this is the this is the Zanussi um, 4.3667, bloody, bloody, bloody. I thought, mate, mate, will it keep my food cold? <laughs> that threw him. Off. <laughs> Obviously a question he's never been asked in all his years, selling fridge freezers. He's like, um, yes, sir, yes, it'll, it'll keep your, your food cold. Okay, good. Will it fit the space? Uh, yes, sir, this will fit the space. Boom. Awesome. Keep my food cold. It will fit the space. Done. We're going to be home soon, darling. This isn't going to take as long as I thought it was going to. Go and warm up the car. How much? Four and a half grand. Four and a half thousand pounds for a fridge. I said to him, gosh, that's rather expensive. <laughs> or something similar. How come it's so much coin? And he said, because of this. And he knocked on the door of the fridge. Three times. Like he was trying to gain entrance to some sort of Masonic lodge. And I'm not making this up, I swear. A screen came on, on the front of the door, showing the inside. <laughs> now obviously it was a display fridge, so there was nothing in there, so it was a bit of an anticlimax. But he thought it was amazing, because he looked at us like, <laughs> As if you were just going to go, we must have it! But he didn't realise he was dealing with Fred and Wilma Flintstone because we just stared at him like, what's the point of that? And he went, well, because this fridge, this is how he was talking, this fridge, sir, has tiny cameras on the inside linked to a discreet LED screen on the front, so that any time you can see what's in your fridge. I was like, all right. Could you not just open the door? 
Because that's what we used to do with our last fridge, and it didn't cost nearly as much as a fucking car. <laughs> More money than cents. Are there people out there that would seriously spend four and a half thousand pounds on a fridge because it's fitted with CCTV? <laughs> And more importantly, what I want to know is, what happened in these people's lives that made them distrustful of their fridge? <laughs> to the point where they felt they've got to spy on the contents. <laughs> Never in my life have I approached my fridge and gone, oh, look, hang on, <laughs> what am I doing here? Opening my fridge willy-nilly. There could be anything in there. If only there was a way I could see what was in there beforehand then I wouldn't get caught out like I did last Tuesday when I found that head. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It could be worse though, I've got a mate. No joke, I was just making a statement. <laughs> I've got a mate, Mel, bless her, love her dearly, but she's very anti-technology. Like, really vehemently anti-technology. And she knows, about, she reads up on all the latest technology specifically so she can be angry about it. And we were, I was telling her about this fridge. And she said, it's going to get worse, Dave. Like, she got a microphone now and everything. It's going to get worse, Dave. I was like, really, Mel? How? She said, they are developing a fridge freezer that's going to be linked to your Wi-Fi, to your internet. And when it senses that it's getting, you're getting low on stuff, like if you're down to your last four pints of milk, it will order you some more online without you asking for it. Or even knowing that you... Or you even knowing that it's doing it. That worries me, because I'm pretty sure that's how Skynet started. <laughs> I, I don't really think I'm comfortable with the idea of having an appliance in my house that's more organised than I am. You know, a nightmare scenario, I'm sat there in my boxes watching TV and there's a knock at the door. Go and answer it, Tesco there, like, your delivery's there, mate. I, I didn't order anything, I don't think. Uh, Mr. Scott, yeah, 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 yeah. You've, you've, um, yeah, got for four pints of milk, some cheese, yeah, yeah, it's you. Um, honey, did you order anything from Tesco's? No, I didn't order. No, mate, you must have the wrong answer. No, 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 you didn't order it. Your fridge ordered it on Tuesday. <laughs> honey, the fridge is alive. <laughs> it's watching us. We can't have sex in the kitchen anymore. <laughs> that's a troubling concept, isn't it? Intelligent. Intelligent technology. Uh, that's, that's just, it's, that's a silly gadget, isn't it? A fridge with a screen on. That is basically just for showing off at dinner parties. Let's be honest. That's the only reason that's been invented, so people can look at my amazing fruit. Indeed. Indeed. Keep up with the Joneses, whoever they were. They must be going very fast, because everybody was trying to keep up with them, weren't they? Uh, dinner parties. Yes, that is, that is another sign of middle age, when you start going to a lot of dinner parties. When I was younger, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I used to used to go pub in and club in and stuff like that. And now I go around to people's houses for quiche. <laughs> Which doesn't bother me because firstly I like quiche. And secondly, I'm inherently nosy and I like looking around other people's houses. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so I like dinner parties. I'm not a big fan of hosting dinner parties. Because obviously there's, there's a lot of pressure when you're hosting a dinner party. You know, your house has got to be, got to be nice and presentable. Which when you're like us and perhaps not the tidiest people in the world, it's a bit of a stress. Particularly, my, my, since my wife and I, we generally, we find we work best to a deadline when it comes to tidying the house. We, we perform best under pressure. So if we've got people coming around at seven, we generally start tidying up at about half six. <laughs> you know, we sort of start, how clean do you want the house, darling? I want it looking like no one actually lives here. I want this house looking like we've been abducted by aliens. All right, I'm on it, babe, I'm on it. I get the pledge out. And I'm spraying pledge around and I'm cleaning and I'm looking at the clock and it's five to seven, at which point everything just goes in the understairs cupboard. Everything in the understairs cupboard. <laughs> Hides a multitude of sins, the understairs cupboard, doesn't it? I get very apprehensive when people are around our house. If they go anywhere near the understairs cupboard, I'm like, don't, don't go near the understairs cupboard. Please don't, don't, don't open the door. Don't open the door. All right, you'll be like a Chilean mine collapse. All right, you will die. Don't open the understairs cupboard. I've no idea what's in there, but I'm pretty sure there'll probably be a slush puppy machine because everyone's got a slush puppy machine in the understairs cupboard. Uh, I, I had my world rocked um, a year or two ago. We went, we went to. A, I had a dinner party sprung on me at short notice. 
I got home from work and the wife was like, oh, we're going round to Mike and Hannah's for dinner tonight. I'm like, who are Mike and Hannah? Oh, you know Mike and Hannah. I don't know Mike and Hannah. You do. Hannah works in HR. Mike's the one with the eyebrows. Oh, going round to Mike and Hannah's. And we went round to Mike and Hannah's for dinner and their house was scary clean. I mean, like, serial killer kill room clean. It was like being on a space station. <laughs> you had to take your shoes off when you went in and everything. And my wife was instantly very intimidated. 